What's up guys, this is Nick at stridewise.com and I am here in London, UK with the inimitable Ian Barry, an artist who makes things ex exclusively from denim these days, isn't it? Yeah, only out of jeans, blue jeans. For want of a better word, it's like collage, layering up the different shades together to, to make it so when you stand back, it looks like a, a painting. You know, shown in your home country of Australia to um, you know many of the cities in America. And I thought for a long time to say, my work's not about denim, it's just my medium and you know, all this art thing, but it actually forced me to rethink about a lot of the things that have been going on in the back of my mind, to think about the, the actual material. You know, as you'll find out as you delve more into denim, you'll find the word duality quite a lot, that, you know, it's material we all love, but there's also a bad side of it because by becoming so popular, it's become so big, um, does that mean it's become boring or does it mean that it's accessible to all of us? Is it democratic or does it stand for freedom or the opposite side of that? But it's just part of capitalist culture now. 99% have always been donations or 99.9% .9%. and you know people who are watching this probably already seen in the comments like oh those jeans could go this place that place and you know I you know I get lots of jeans I forward them on to homeless shelters uh, school projects because I know which jeans I'm going to use. The sad part of it is uh, I don't find it hard to get jeans. You know, there's too many jeans in the world, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, shoot me now, like I'm saying there's too many jeans in the world. And I think there's like eight billion pairs made a year. I know that in your earlier work, the theme of community was very strong in your work. Like you would make like uh, pubs and uh, laundromats and uh, a lot of like uh, communal areas out of denim. And I always think about this, like when I'm out, I'll have a look around if I'm on a bus or on the city street, and invariably, 95% of people around me are wearing a pair of jeans, and it doesn't matter sort of like which socioeconomic strata they're from, right? That's the beauty of it. Of course, there's different prices of jeans and brands and things, but it is a very democratic material. You know, one of the most beautiful images of denim history, which I think of, is when the Berlin Wall came down. Mm. Um, you know, everybody from the, the West was there in the jeans and it was banned from the East. And it was very, very obvious, this contrast. I think there's something in the jeans which welcomes people into my work. Um, it's something familiar um, and something accessible. Maybe I should say it's my work, but I, I genuinely feel there's something in the jeans which you know, opens a door to allow people to, to see the work. You know, in the 50s, what did the Japanese want to look like? The American servicemen wearing the jeans. Because at the time it stood for freedom, democracy, it was exciting, it was fresh, and, you know, films, you know, obviously the films are massive, so all this... Yeah, know, so it was like a rugged individualism yeah, that gets folded in as well. It, it was um, jeans started by a kind of rural kind of workwear, and now it's a very urban, you know, presenting work which looks at changing communities. I say cheesily, it's the changing fabric of our urban environment. So I'm documenting things which are disappearing right in front of us, like the laundrettes, the pubs, um, which go outside London. They, you know, they really are disappearing in London too. Around here, I run around and um, pass 20 former pubs and there's two left open, you know? Yeah. And these places are places which were hearts of communities. We have our soap operas here, and you don't have that anymore. And community is changing, so that's something which a lot of my work has been about. But you said that these days, in addition to working a lot on your work, including a lot on like the history of jeans, uh, you also said that it's about uh, conflict and other like problems within the industry now. Is is that right? I have become very aware of what about the sustainability of people, uh, workers' rights, uh, how much we're getting paid. You know, there's brands coming out with most sustainable jean ever, and it's thirteen pound at a high street <laughs> store. And you think, well, someone's getting screwed along the line there. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's no, it doesn't seem on trend at the moment to talk about those things like the and, problems with sustainability and you know you could make sustainable things but if people wearing it once or twice then is it sustainable if it's coming wrapped in plastic my point is that it, i don't feel like it's getting to the end consumer there's too many people in the industry talking to other people in the industry and trying to impress each other it's like when i used to work in advertising you used to make advertising often to impress other people in advertising over the years i started thinking about the people making the 
the denim, the, the rolls of denim and you know, the cotton production. You know, there's so much cotton in the world, but people are doing f things to make better cotton, uh, traceability of it. Uh, it doesn't always have to be cotton. One thing that I've found uh, interesting lately is the, the the rise of organic cotton. And I think that's like a really good example of something that I think to a lot of people it sounds like a bit hokey and gimmickish, but like actually it uses like a lot less uh, water, a lot less pesticides, like the carbon footprint of cotton, which is like, you know, one of the biggest crops uh, in, in on yeah. earth. Uh, is actually meaningful and like getting organic cotton it sounds a bit hippy dippy but actually there are there are very meaningful uh contributions that can make to like you know an individual's carbon footprint you know as an artist i make things with my hands so i see things differently from maybe how i did then and you know um, i might be in risk of isolating myself here but like with clothes i see it as an art form that if i can find a craft gene maker or somebody who's making something themselves, which I can meet and they've got a team of three or four people, for example, it's, it's an investment. And I know that if I have that, if I have that jacket, I know it'll last 10, 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, you, know, you might pay a bit more for it because it's, you know, those people are getting good wages and it's somebody's own livelihood and not just a massive big brand. Actually, if you think of raw denim, it's actually a very, very good example of what could be sustainable. Yeah. Like, it's only just hit me that, like, the beauty of it is you wear it in and you earn the kind of right. And That's a big part of it. over 10 years. Yeah, a lot of people talk to me about that, about how it's, it's more, it's a more sustainable, actually especially because a lot of them have, like... By having it for a long time, is actually a badge of honor, whereas most people think of something old is not. Exactly. I was recently talking to a Han at a Black Horse Lane, uh, and he told me that you spend a lot of time thinking about the relationship between jeans and denim and African Americans when, when, like, when you do depict African Americans in your work because they were so involved in the production of cotton, although obviously unwillingly as slaves. Among African Americans, it was often seen as a symbol of the work they used to be forced to do and how sometimes during the civil rights movements, you saw more African Americans like at civil rights marches wearing jeans as a way of reclaiming that, like the, the, the relationship there, I think a lot of people don't think about. You know, I think the problem still exists today, but if you think of denim as this mass produced thing now that its early heritage was from slave picking of cotton and indigo. And, you know, so we already started off with this, you know, just putting it aside for a second, the horrors of all that. You're already starting off from this start point where you get used to a certain price for what you should pay for something. So even to this day, there's like 40 million people living in modern day slavery. You know, one of my early exhibitions, for example, was in the, the South, in um, New Orleans. You know, and it, I've always been aware of the, the history of where cotton came from, and obviously that goes into the denim. And it, it's, I mean, it's so hard to talk about because, you know, you, it, you, nothing can make you even imagine what it was like to, to go through that. But one thing which I find so fascinating about the material is that it went from, you know, terrible times and where the plantation worker was wearing all white, a beautiful suit kind of thing, and the, the workers would end up wearing jeans and it was linked to sharecropping and all these things. And the musicians, for example, would not wear denim on stage and Elvis refused to wear jeans, which ironically was forced to in Jailhouse Rock. It meant a lot of people copied him. But most, um, you know, African-Americans, black people would not choose to wear denim because it was linked to this. But then gradually, often from what I believe sometimes mistakes, that people would wear it to make a point, but other people saw it and started copying that look. Through the generations, there were certain musicians who started wearing it, but there were certain people started wearing it and taking ownership of it, which I thought it was quite powerful to then get to the early 2000s where you have the rappers and um, R&B singers with their own denim brands. And I thought that was so kind of cool because it was just like taking ownership of it. And it was a strength for, for me, denims for everybody. So when you meet people that are experiencing your art for the first time, like they know they're going to see art made from jeans, but what 
Is there anything that surprises them when they, when they see it in person? There's two strands of that, because obviously some people see my work having no knowledge of my work. And they don't realize it's made of denim straight up. They're like, they think it's blue photography, blue right. painting. Uh, so then obviously then they get closer and then it's like, like a half actor they find out it's made of jeans. But then what I found really fascinating is the, mainly the journalists who have maybe written about me for maybe 10 years. I've been in their magazine several times. And then you go and show near them and they come and see the work and they're like, oh my God, I didn't realize it was like this. And I was like, you've been writing about me for years. And it's because the work is very layered. Um, for example, I counted how many layers on one of the laundrettes that I made and it was 15 layers of jeans. Wow. So it's very three dimensional. And right. you know, if, if you see it on Instagram, the internet is shrunk down. You don't really get the, the depths, the textures, the feeling of the denim, the color blue is so hard to reproduce. Like, mm. So if people wanted to see your art in person, is that, does your website keep uh, an updated like list of your showings? Yeah, yeah, I'm very old fashioned, so I still got on a website and still update it. <laughs> okay, cool, great. Well, thank you for having me in this incredible studio. Uh, I've learned a lot and this has been like really incredible. It's my favorite thing I've done in England. Look him up and subscribe if you just kind of wound up on this video and uh, thanks for having me. No, thank you for coming. All right. <laughs> <laughs>